This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. Probably the biggest word in business right now is not even a word. It's two letters, AI. And AI is literally changing our business life every single day. Some of us are not so sure, are there, are there things we could be doing with it that we're not? We're pretty sure there are. And how do we actually use AI on a day-to-day -day basis so that it enhances what we do and then doesn't replace what we do? And we have an, the expert, I think, in this field of how to combine AI with people, uh, Kate B Bravery, who recently released the book, Work Different, 10 Truths for Winning in the People Age. Kate, it is a delight to have you on our show today. Oh, Tom, it's wonderful to be here and talking on my favorite topic. So thank you for inviting me. And, and if you would, give us a little of your background and how you started talking about this uh, combination of subjects of working differently and uh, using AI as a positive, not a negative. Yeah. Um, so I'm a chartered organizational psychologist at Mercer. I lead our talent advisory practice globally. And even since a young kid, I've always been fascinated by the opportunities technology is going to be. I think my very first presentation when I was about 12 um, was on virtual reality. And uh, I think uh, my imagination about what education would look like um, didn't quite play out. Um, but a lot of the things that I think organizational psychologists have talked about in terms of how the world can be different is actually being ushered in now because of this new technology. And it's it's quite an oxymoron because a lot of people sort of say, well, you talk about the people age, and yet aren't we in the digital age? And actually, our belief is that this technology is actually going to enhance human creativity, human productivity. And I think we're on the cusp of some phenomenal human machine teaming that I hope is going to make the world of work and our lives a lot easier than it maybe it is today. I, I love that. Let, let's start with a really big picture, Kate. And if you would, um, explain it if you can, um, or if you would, what AI is and what it isn't to the workplace. Hmm. Well, you know, AI is not new. It's been around with Brown for decades. Um, obviously, ChatGPT burst onto our scenes, you know, a year ago. And I think that got us all excited about what this latest fourth generation of AI could usher in, in terms of human machine teaming. And that's why I think it has entered everybody's language. I mean, I would even say that 2023 was sort of the year of, uh, you know, generative AI, because you're right, everybody was talking about it. Um, but if we just take um, the world of work, we've you know, been benefiting from AI for an incredibly long time, whether it is just being able to handle large data and improve our processes, whether we, the way we do payroll, or whether it is a bit more sophisticated where we're using machine learning to understand large data sets and how our employees might be feeling, or whether we're actually using that to predict what they might do given how they're feeling and other parameters such as how many people that their boss are managing or when do they last get a pay rise. You know, we've actually got quite used to that for a long time. I think though, a lot of those more process-driven approaches, even with machine learning, felt very different to what we're experiencing now, which is tapping into the area of knowledge workers and human creativity and coming up with completely novel music, completely novel articles. And, and that's quite exciting, but of course it's where a lot of the, the fears are coming in. Yeah, for sure. So um, let's talk about, you know, you, you talk a lot about organizational behavior and, and people, and uh, you talk about, um, about using AI to actually make, um, education or training specific, you refer to what the Khan Academy has done. And can you talk a little bit about that? How would we use, because in, in, in the CPA profession, in the, in the financial uh, field, of course, we're constantly training our employees. I mean, it is, it, it, it's, it's a very complex field. So can you kind of run us through that? How does AI get involved in that? How do we use it that way? Mm -hmm. So I think AI has got lots of applications that are relevant to the whole suite of learning. Um, 
firstly, we've got AI that's being used to identify latent skills we might have by scraping some of the things that we say on LinkedIn or places we've been before and making recommendations of what skills we have today and what skills we might need to, to tomorrow to close the gap. That information is being used on sort of talent marketplaces to match those skills to potential opportunities, which gives really rich learning. That information can also be used to say, if you've got gaps in these skills, what are the type of learning that we can search on the wider internet and bring that to you so it's much more customized? And of course, this latest generation of AI can actually create some of that learning content as well. So I think before we were all talking about ChatGPT, it was a lot of the visual communication aids that it could bring. And turning that into training is something that has really taken off in this last year. Well, so let's break that down a little bit because I'm fascinated uh, by the education field and training. This is a lot of what we do at uh, at our company, WealthAbility. So how does that work? I mean, in other words, what first of all, how does AI or how would you use AI to identify what the gaps are in somebody's knowledge? So normally what you're doing is you've got lots of different AIs that are coming together. One is going to be looking at um, jobs that we have today and what are the skills that are associated with success in those jobs. Then you can also look at the individuals you have and what skills we predict they might have, which they can then confirm or assert. And then there's a, that matching process. I think where the magic happens is when we're linking that data to mm -hmm. our large language, uh, sorry, to our um, LMS systems internally. And we're allowing us to say, based on where you want to go in your career, where you've got, we would recommend these types of learnings. And that recommend is getting even more personalized with large language models that can look at lots of people who have got similar jobs of you and can also scroll lots of learning that might already exist within your organization. I think the application to use large language models to make the world of knowledge that we have easier to navigate is really exciting. I think the big change we're going to see this year is related to voice interface as well. So as opposed to looking up a particular program, getting much more personalized, but also offering verbal inquiries so that you're getting responses back, whether it's it's learning in the flow of work, so what you need to answer a, a challenge today, or whether it's recommending learning programs um, that are in the, the wider sphere, I think that interface is going to make a huge difference. Interesting. So I, I can see how Morgan Stanley can make this work because they've got huge amounts of data for years and years and years. Let's drill down to a small business. Say you've got a business with 10 people in the business. How does that business take advantage of, of this um, technology? Well, a lot of the examples we've talked about have been companies bringing large language models in-house. Right. But I also think there's huge advantage by using the chat GPTs and other large language models that are already available in the, you know, in the world that we live, whether it is um, creating a new marketing campaign for your business because you are um, asking the large language models to make recommendations for slides or doing voiceover animation for that, whether it is having much more tailored uh, market outreach to all your clients that can be completely customized um, to different groups that you want to target much quicker than we can do it as humans. Or whether it's just speeding up the way you might be creating your own learning content. You know, one of the things I've been really excited about this year as we brought our own language model, large language model in house is you're never starting with a blank presentation. You're never starting with a blank policy or a blank Q&A or a blank learning, learning program. As soon as you're starting to put in, these are some of the things that we want to learn. These are some of the learning outcomes, content, whether it is learning content, visual content, written content can be generated at breakneck speed. That means that as humans are then tiller touching that to get that where we need, as opposed to starting from scratch. So that blended learning between humans and machine is beginning to happen. And, and it's just changing the way people are creating content and interacting with the content that already exists. Well, I, there's there's so much to un unpack there. I, I, I love this idea because I find myself, I love editing, but, but, but you know, writing from scratch takes a long time. And so what I'm seeing is, is that um, ChatGPT, as an example, 
uh, allows us to not have to write from scratch. And we still need to edit it. We still need to make sure you make a point in your book that you still need to make sure you're drawing from accurate information in the first place. And we all know that just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's accurate information. So we still need to draw, you know, you know we, need to, we need to verify the information. We need to make sure it's worded in our voice. Um, although I'm finding more and more, I can actually write something and say, write it in Tom Wheelwright's voice. And it's, Absolutely. it's amazing how, how close it is to my voice. I mean, really, when you think about it, if, if you've ever hired a copywriter to write marketing copy or any other kind of copy, the goal is, is for them to write it in your voice, right? You don't want them writing it in their voice. You want to write it in your voice. And, uh, with, um, with the new AI tools, you've got a really head, really big head start. So it seems like there's no more, is there an excuse for not doing some of the things that we might not have done in the past as a business owner, just because we didn't have time to do it. So it sounds like this frees up, this has the potential to free up an enormous amount of time for the business owner. Yeah. And our, our, our recent research shows that most executives believe that they can get at least a 30% productivity lift by integrating more AI. And I think the conversation in the past has been very much dem uh, dom conversation in the past has been dominated by more process improvements and efficiency. Now we're looking at you know, how can we look at cognitive augmentation and how can those processes um, be sped up? But I think the real gain is, is more what you're talking about there, Tom. It's not just I've saved extra time, so maybe I can then take more time back. I can spend more time in learning. It's actually we will end up doing more higher, more value-adding work. To your point, you don't want to start with a blank sheet of paper. It sometimes takes a long time to get started. If we're always starting with something that is 40%, you know, 40% baked, we're going to be further along in that process. Tom, you bring up some really good points there. Um, the first one is, you know, as we start to rely on this information more, we absolutely do need to make sure that that human is in front of the text. So this obvious ones is <clears throat> if you're transcribing some of the information that a doctor has and that turns into a prescription, obviously there's warning bells there. We need to have a human involved. But there's much more subtle things that list within the organization where we might be making recommendations that impacts people's long-time financial health. And if we're not monitoring that, that's exposure that we have at a business level. So I do think how people are using that. And unlike other risks that we have in our business that are often constrained to a particular department, because Gen AI is nascent tech, because um, it is an all-purpose tool, we are only just learning as we go what are some of the ethical concerns? What are some of the exposures? What are some of the cyber risks that we need to be aware of? So I do think we've got to balance that optimism and that enthusiasm to use it with some guardrails. No, I love that. And, and certainly what, one of the nice things we're seeing is more and more of the AI tools are saying, you've got a choice to keep this private. And I think that choosing that privacy is critical um, because all of us have intellectual property. And we don't want that intellectual property just to be out there. We we need to make sure that, you know, it's it's not being come part of the, the general vernacular, basically, of, of the world. Um, but I want to go back to something um, you were talking about, which is on the learning, because I think there's some fear, uh, particularly for those of us who are older, baby boomers, we'll just say, hey, boomer here, and um, like myself. Um, and, and the question I had the other day from a fellow boomer was, okay, well, if you don't learn the basics, how are you ever really going to understand how it works? And and because if if you've got AI doing all the basics for you, which is kind of the idea to me, that's the ultimate goal is AI does everything that it can do. And then we do, you know, what we can do, what AI can't do, um, basically. So it raises the level of what we can do. So in other words, instead of a staff person, they start out used to tick and tie cash, right? Make sure cash was accurate. Well, between AI and blockchain technology, they're not going to need to do that. Okay, they don't need to, we don't have four column uh, <laughs> worksheets to do our debits and our credits on. But without learning that, do you think that, do you, do you see that as an issue with how people process or do you actually think that people will just process differently? 
both. <laughs> so uh, lots of things to unpack there. I think is exciting and it's scary. On the exciting side, um, because generative AI is going to give us a lift, it is going to be the, the lift is for the people. The lift doesn't come from the tech. So we absolutely need to be in parallel upgrading human skills and leaning more on the, the contextual experience knowledge that more senior or more tenured talent like us, like you know, Jane X and baby boomers bring to the equation because that's where we're going to get the difference because large language models is raising up the skill of everyone. If you think about, you put a domain specific large language model around health in the hands of a nurse versus a doctor, it gives that lift for that nurse but the information they have is the same as other nurses. So if you're wanting to, um, you know, differentiate, it's going to be the experience of the humans that are that are in the room. So we've got to we've got to get that that piece right. Um, there's huge advantage though in terms of the talent that we can bring in and the movement we can have from our talent teams because if people have that, they can make mid career moves much easier. And sometimes that's really challenging for older workers. You can have younger people step up earlier in their career, which gives us a cost leverage. Um, and we can probably take some more risks on non-traditional talent that maybe don't have quite all the qualifications that we would expect in, let's say, a junior analyst because they've got this great tool to, to lean on. The flip side, though, is that those junior analysts and workers don't get the same experiences that you and I did. You and I can look at a balance sheet and we will have a sense check does this look right? Is something off because we've got years and years of experience? Uh, Malcolm Gladwell calls that thin slicing. We are going to lose some of that. That muscle is going to atrophy because the young people coming into our workforce will not have done their time. And we talk a lot in the book about young people's expectations versus more tenured people's expectations. You know, we did our time to get where we are. We did our qualifications to get where we are. That is absolutely moving. Now, on the one hand, um, that is good news for so many people because they're saying, I want to be rewarded for the skills and the expertise I bring today. And I don't want to be held back by doing a three or four year degree that has no relevance. So on the one hand, it's a fit for the time. But if those analysts are not honing those skills, what are the new skills that they are learning? And how do we make sure that those human checks and balances are there? Because the human checks and balances work because the humans have that tacit knowledge. So here we have to look at what are the checks and balances that the AI also needs to be doing as well as the humans. And that's an area that is uncharted territory for many of us. There was a really good experiment um, that came out the other week from the Harvard Business School saying they are seeing that people are either like centurions. Um, so, you know, half man, half horse. They're deciding which tasks to allocate to AI, which tasks to allocate to humans. Um, and then they're configuring workflows differently. And for others, they're like cyborgs. They are, you know, starting a sentence and the computer is finishing it. And both of those are just skills that you and I didn't learn. And it just changed the face of learning. And it also means we miss out on learning that we previously relied on. You're listening to WealthAbility for CPAs, not just because Tom Wheelwright is entertaining, but to become a better strategic tax advisor. Attorney John Scabland and his law firm, Scabland PLLC, presents with Tom Wheelwright to accountants and works with tax advisors throughout the United States implementing strategic tax plans that protect the client's assets. Take your expertise and client value to another level by working with John. Tax professionals rave about John's approach to asset protection. John enables your client to start small and increase the complexity of their plan as their assets grow. John will custom tailor a plan that is both affordable and effective. John Scabland is your asset protection attorney who will work with your tax strategy and within your client's budget. Go to ultimateassetprotection.com and schedule a time to meet with John. Yeah, it, it's interesting too. So I have uh, two grandchildren, six and eight, and I will tell you their brains are wired completely different. That They just have a different wiring because technology to them is just how things are done. And so it, it's... I can't, uh, yeah, I can't put myself in their place or, or my employees who are uh, Gen Zers. I, I can't put myself in their place because they grew up with technology. And so their, their brains literally are wired differently. And so, um, but I do fear 
that if you don't know how to do math, that two plus two equals four, if you don't know how to do that in your head, um, do you really, are, are you enabling um, a loss of that, that brain power? But basically, are you, you, like you said, atrophying your brain because you're not using, you, you haven't gotten down to the basics. You haven't gone down to the fundamentals because AI or technology is doing it for you. You know, this argument was also mounted many years ago as to whether you allow calculators yes. in schools. <laughs> no, <I'm back laughs> so it, you allow, allow, we have it um, with our CPA exam. Um, when I took the CPA exam, you had you did all your math with a pencil and paper. There were no calculators allowed. And now you'd go, well, that's so stupid. Why would you do that? That's such a waste of, of energy and time. I have statistics as well. You know, I learned SPSS and you type all your coding exactly. there. You're very proud because you did your time and then you got the result. And now you just pick what you want and it, it runs it automatically. Like, you know, on, on, in some ways, I think, you know, the world does move, move on and, it, and it's not going to stop for us. So we have to move with it. I think when we look at young people, there's quite a few topics that you brought up. And um, funnily enough, just today, I heard that 20% of five-year-olds have their own iPhone. Mm -hmm. And as an organizational psychologist who has children th themselves, I worry about that because the impact on attention span, the impact on aggression, the impact on our ability to learn when we constantly are being bombarded with information is uh, is is a is a real concern, and it's a real concern for children under the age of ten. So, you know, I think we have to look at that differently, whilst also acknowledging that what's going to make them a successful employee will be their ability to work with technology, their learnability, their curiosity, and the more we can encourage some of those traits, the better they're going to thrive in the environment that we live. But I think we need to, as with generative AI in-house, we need to be very, very clear around the guardrails, the ethics, the IP exposure, the things that we need to protect and we need to take more of a stance on whilst not pulling back on the, the learning and the curiosity that is generating new ways of working and new ways of reallocating the tasks in a job so that we can get the best out of the humans and the best out of the tech. So let's look at, at um, businesses specifically, particularly in the finance area. What do you see um, as the best tools right now from an AI standpoint? And what do you see as the future of tools, particularly in the um, financial? I mean, if you can kind of put yourself in the financial services, because this is more, you know, it's a very technical area, right? It would be not, I, I don't think it'd be a whole lot different than the, than fr frankly, healthcare area. I mean, it's very technical right, in, in the knowledge base. Um, what do you see as currently, what are some of the, the best ways to use AI? And what do you see five years down the road coming on? Look, I think the most exciting thing at the moment is how AI is being combined with the processes that we use day in, day out. So I think the combination of OpenAI and Microsoft is getting everybody very excited because obviously Microsoft does integration with our day-to-day -day work products right. really well. And OpenAI has obviously probably the, the most well-known large language model at the moment. So I think all eyes are, are looking at what that integration will be. And I think you will start to see how humans do tasks changing because you're doing them in cooperation, very much like you're seeing with open, um, you're seeing with um, Copilot now, Copilot infiltrating uh, how you look at the emails that you have and prioritize them. If you're in the meeting, it's going to nudge you, hey, you've got the emails from these people. These are the ones that I think are important. And I started the email for you. So again, taking over some of those tasks that are very unique to us, you're also going to, you know, have that integrated into your Word documents, into your Excel, how you do your calculations. A lot of, a lot of those process-based ac activity will go on steroids. But I think the more exciting piece will be how we can scenario plan. If these three or four variables chain, paint me a picture of what that will look like. And we're living in a climate of unprecedented risk, which are all interconnecting. We're living in a very volatile um, economic climate. We've got, I think, 
40 different countries going to the polls in the next 18 months. Um, these are more variables than the human brain can continue, but they have very big implications on the world of work and the world of finance. Being able to model some of those scenarios and build recommendations off that, I think is going to give us tremendous foresight that we just don't have today. My belief is everyone's obsessed with the productivity gains. And I think that is just the first baby step. For me, it's this opportunity to use large language models to predict outcomes, to scenario pan, that is way more exciting. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, to personalize that to your preferences. You, Tom, you said, I never like to you know, start from a blank sheet. That's saying, well, the AI that's working with you day in, day out will know your preferences. They'll have read all your books and will write in your style, probably better than you can write in your style. <laughs> you know, but you know, the the need for an editor, um, then the the speed at which you can get podcasts and articles out, that'll change dramatically. And I think the access to other types of AI and applications through um voice mode will also unlock opportunities that we're just beginning to look at at the moment. All right, last question for you. So uh, we have people in all age ranges, right? So those who are, I'm, I'm thinking my 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 Gen Zers, um, you know, the the younger kids. This is like just natural to them, right? I mean, even Gen Xers grew up gaming. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up gaming. Yeah. I mean, you know, my my idea of gaming is solitaire, right, on my phone. So, um, but I I just didn't grow up with that, you know. And then you read Elon Musk's book about this was a lot of his what really changed his thought process was actually, and he plays video games all the time. And so my question is, take the older generation. I think a lot of people in the older generations are um, particularly baby boomers, but also um, to a lesser extent, Gen Xers are going, how do I cope with this? Because my brain doesn't just naturally go there. So any recommendations that you have for how does um, how does somebody who's, who's not as comfortable with technology get comfortable with this like uh, amazing technology that we've got now? Mm -hmm. I agree with you. The It's not just generational. It's also the experiences that we have in our life. I have the privilege of doing Mercer's Global Talent Trend Study every year. And the attitudes in Japan and Korea to sure. the use of robots and technology is very different to the West. Even in mainland China, um, the excitement around tech and surveillance and how some of that AI is being used in that field well, one, it's been prohibited in, in some of the Western countries, but the curiosity and interest in it and just the acceptance of that is very different. So I do think the exposure we have makes makes a big difference. The more we practice it, the more we will learn from the machine, the machine will learn from us, and that will help with personalization, which I think is one of the hugest opportunities in the future. And then secondly, it's our imagination. Um, as we get exposure, you know, I think it's only bound by our ability to say, if we combine this technology with this technology, where it's going to land us. Or Gen X and baby boomers saying, I know this business really well. What's the business opportunity that G Gen AI can be in service of? Because a lot of the conversation we've been having has really hugged the broad application, which I think will just change the way we work every day. But the real lift is going to come from solving those business problems for our clients by using this tech in new ways. And that's only bound by human inspiration. So we need the, the exposure and the inspiration, and they are multiply reinforcing. What I would say is we're on the cusp of this human machine teaming that will impact all of us, not just in the world of work, but in our personal life. And two things are going to make a difference. One, how much exposure we have to the tech. I think it's a lot less frightening than other tech that we've had. The fact that, um, you know, we used to recommend to our kids, oh, you know, become an analyst, learn coding, you know, become a data scientist. A lot of those aspects are now being done by the machines. Right. So actually our, our, our narrative is completely changing there. Secondly, as I've said before, I think the premium is on the context. How can we teach that context, context to the machines that we're working with us? If we're going to seed some of the decisions to them, we've also got to make sure that they share our values. And I think some of the more tenured 
talent that we have in our businesses is really good at training younger people on what's the trade-offs and why would we make this decision over that decision? And that's what's going to make the tech work with us a lot better. You also mentioned about those, you know, the younger generations as well. And, you know, one of the things that I, one of the reasons why I think it's so important that um, older talent leans into the tech and is part of the conversation is this tech, just like YouTube, is training our kids. It's training our kids on um, preferences, morals, belief systems. We need to lean in and be part of that education process, just the way that you know, when we interact with the tools, it's educating us on what's a good prompt and what gives you a good response. We also need to be educating it on what's acceptable, what works within the parameters of the profession that we work in. What are the moralistic trade-offs? Because that's how I think we're all going to have a better outcome from working with this technology. No, I, I love that. And, and one of the things I uh, thought about a lot is that we can lean into what we we do know because we do have experiences. For example, I began my career and we had what we called LexisNexis and it was a separate keyboard, a separate machine and used Boolean connectors, okay? You had to do within five words of this, right? Or an and and an or and all of those things. But that's really all AI is. They they AI's just taken that and, and automated it. And so the fact that we learned how to do that, the fact we learned how to search, I do find that I can find something, even if if I look up something on Google and my young staff looks something up on Google, I will be able to get the 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 best answer within minutes. And and they will never and they may never find the best answer because they they have not their brains have not been trained to do that search. But what I'm hearing a lot of you saying is that 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 cognitive um, skill set of being able to do those searches is really just super beneficial when you're talking about the AI tools. Yeah, and it's not just being able to do search on steroids. It's also do the search, look at these multiple de uh, documents and give me the five or six salient points. Mm -hmm. So we write a lot in the book about how it's delivering amplified intelligence because your advice will be based on probably more articles and research and insight and predictive modeling that you would normally um, bring to the table. And I think that's really exciting for pe particularly for people which are in knowledge professions like you and I are in. Awesome. So the book is Work Different, 10 Truths for Winning the People Age. And uh, Kate Bravery and her uh, team did a remarkable job with this book. Highly recommend it. Kate, how can we find out more about your work and what you're doing? Um the mercer.com website is probably probably best if you're interested in talent trends what are the big talent trends that are hitting it and how is ai intersecting we've got a global talent report trend report coming out i think that's end of february um, early march the book is available now so if you go on there you can um obviously buy it through amazon but you also see local distributors that you can connect the book i also have a podcast myself on the new shape of work where we talk to leading companies around how they're innovating on ai and their talent practices um, and also follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I get out and about talking about some of these topics. Um, and the book is filled with lots of client examples of how people are innovating and how they're trying to think and work a little bit different. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Kate. Um, thanks for being with us, everyone. Uh, remember, as, as we're using these tools and we get better, not just for ourselves, not just for our staff, but also for our clients, uh, we're going to end up with better clients, a better practice, and a better life. We'll see you all next time. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to wealthability.com. Thank you.